Hello and a very warm welcome back to those of you who joined us yesterday. To those who have just joined, a hearty welcome to the 8th annual South Africa Tomorrow Investor Conference. I'm your host, Nikiwe Bigicha. The COVID-19 pandemic has tested the world in many ways. Technology has never been more vital than it is today. Organizations have had to be nimble in figuring out solutions on how best to serve customers and deliver their goods and services. It's certainly been a tumultuous time, but it also presents some opportunities. Let's get some perspectives now from business leaders who have been in the trenches. I hand over now to John Kim from UBS to introduce today's panelists and lead the discussion. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's plenary session regarding digital transformation. We're very fortunate and honored to have the CEOs of the Standard Bank Group, NASPERS, and We Buy Cars joining us today for this panel. Now, uh, before we start, I'd like each of the speakers to give a brief introduction to the wider audience on their work, on their background and their company, please. Over to Sim. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I've had the privilege of being part of a fantastic panel um, with old friends. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Standard Bank is a group of banks, asset managers, and uh, insurance companies. It is the largest financial services organization on the African continent. We employ 50,000 people in 20 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, which makes up, in our case, roughly 70% of uh, our uh, GDP. We have colleagues based in London, New York, uh, Dubai, and uh, uh, Beijing, and Sao Paulo, who help us to facilitate the movement of trade goods, people, and ideas between the African continent and the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Puti, could you give a brief introduction on yourself as well, please? Thank you, John. So Naspers is a global consumer internet group. Um, we're one of the largest technology investors in the world. Uh, we build leading companies um, and we empower people and enrich communities. We are committed to investing in entrepreneurs in leading um, technology businesses that improve the lives of people at scale. We operate in about 80 markets around the world, including China, Brazil, India, and South Africa. And every day, around one and a half billion people interface uh, with the different products and services that are NASPERS backed. In South Africa, NASPERS is the largest company on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And we play an important role in ensuring that we meet the requirements of our shareholders and our customers. And essentially here in South Africa, the businesses that we have are Take A Lot, Media24, um, and a number of other businesses. Um, but most importantly, we recently formed the NASPERS Foundry, where we invest um, in internet-based uh, businesses, um, early stage businesses. And um, additionally, we also have an entity called Labs, where we are supporting uh, young people um, to be able to have access to the internet and to have accredited learning uh, through the internet as well. Thank you. Great. And Fawn, over to you, please. Uh, good day, John. Yes, We Buy Cars is a 20-year-old company um, that was started in 2001. Um, we are buying and selling motor vehicles, um, but in a different way. We uh, grew organically over many years, and today we employ over a thousand people. We have a national footprint in South Africa and we um, buy and sell in excess of six and a half thousand vehicles per month. Um, in recent times, we've developed the capability to do e-commerce and trade and buy and sell vehicles online. Fantastic. Great. Thank you all for the introductions. Now, what I'd like to do is to kick off the panel today talking about COVID-related lockdowns oh, and the changes they changes they've put uh, into the workplace. So I'd like you to take a little bit, take us through a little bit about how COVID and related lockdowns have changed how you work uh, internally and also how you interact with customers. Sim, could I ask you to kick us off, please? Uh, thank you very much, John. I think the first place to start is uh, how we decided to approach uh, COVID at Standard Bank. Uh, we recognize it as a one in a hundred year crisis. Um, and we chose to focus on the safety and security of our staff first. 
Uh, we focused very, very heavily on making sure that we protected uh, the health and safety of our people. I'm sure you'll have seen this, John. There was a fascinating article a couple of weeks ago uh, in, in Forbes where they provided a checklist of what you need to do uh, as an employer in these circumstances. And the gist of it is you've got to look after the safety and health of your people. You've got to talk about it like it matters and you've got to act like it matters. And that is where we started. We acquired PPEs. We introduced the separation of our people. Uh, we separated, for example, our dealing room, which was one of the first uh, things we did. Uh, we introduced working from home. So by way of example, I've been working, uh, running Standard Bank from this room uh, since uh, early March. And I've been to the office only three times. The first time was to attend our annual general meeting. The second time was because a worker put a spade through the fiber just outside uh, our, our home. And then the third time, I cannot explain, but there was hardly any connectivity. I had to hop into the car and go to the office for, for this purpose. So 80% of Standard Bank employees have been working from home over the last uh, uh, eight, eight to nine months. Uh, that's been the case here in South Africa, and that's been the case in the 19 other subsidiaries that we have outside uh, South Africa. The next set of considerations is just the use of resources. So one little example is um, the use of data uh, in our organization has gone up 35 times, 35 times. And that's, I suppose, as a consequence of people working from home. The use of paper has declined precipitously. Uh, the use of utilities, power, electricity, water has declined. Uh, we are having to confront uh, the usage of space. And so some of the debates we're going through right now are, well, you know, some people are going to be working 100% in the office, some 50%, some three to two days a week. So there'll be a hybrid. And what are the consequences for uh, real estate uh, in those circumstances? And we're thinking uh, that through. The next set of issues we've had to contend with um, have been the impact that this has had on our customers. And so in April, so March and April, we saw a complete collapse in some activity. So airlines, tourism, it was just a complete collapse. And in fact, it hasn't improved much. Uh, I was looking at the statistics just the other day. Uh, the deeds office closed. Uh, a farm would know that uh, cars, just nobody was buying and selling cars. Uh, right up until around June. Uh, those trends have reversed somewhat. Um, what we did see, however, was a dramatic increase uh, in e-commerce. So I'm sure Kuti will be speaking about that uh, a bit later. So some fundamental changes in the way we ourselves are operating and the fundamental changes in the way our customers are operating. Our response to our customers was we decided to use our Fortress balance sheet to stand with our customers. Um, and so we immediately acted on providing solutions for uh, individuals, for small uh, to medium enterprises, provided loan, guarantee, uh, loan extensions, uh, uh, restructured loans. And in our retail bank, that was to the extent of roughly 120 billion rand. Uh, in our corporate and investment bank, it was to the extent of roughly 50 billion rand. So standing shoulder to shoulder with our customers. And lastly, uh, we have made contributions to society in various different ways, including helping our staff uh, make a response, uh, make a practical response to uh, ameliorating the impact with, on the societies in which you operate. I have to say to you, just in closing, we don't believe that Standard Bank will ever be the same again pursuant to uh, COVID. Thank you very much. Great. It's a nice segue to you, Puti, about the, the growth of e-commerce. Could you give us some color there? Thank you very much, John. So I think similar to, to Standard Bank, as Sim was just indicating, um, this has really been a time of unprecedented challenges and uncertainty for, for, for all of us around the world. Um, and certainly, I don't think any business has been immune to what we've seen in terms of the impact um, of, of COVID-19 and the associated lockdown restrictions. So we too faced a number of challenges. Uh, from the onset, we took the decision to put our people first. And so the first thing that we did was to provide support to our partners and customers. 
Um, and we further supported economies in which we operate and primarily um, South Africa and India. And so looking at South Africa, what we did was to um, ensure that we could insist, uh, assist with respect to providing a billion rands worth of PPE, um, which we did with the support of our partners, Ten in China, as well as the government uh, of China. Um, in addition to that, we made a 500, 500 million rand uh, contribution to the Solidarity Fund. Um, and so in that way, we were, you know, doing, um, playing our role in terms of supporting the government with respect to dealing uh, with the impact of COVID-19. Um, with respect to our employees, we made sure that they had access to all of their requirements. One of the things that we saw was that um, employees were um, having, uh, you know, to have access to computers, et cetera. Not every single employee had access to that. And so we had to quickly ensure that we had a rollout um, of that so that people could be able to home. And in fact, we closed um, our offices and started working from home sooner before the government even made an announcement um, around the closure of, of, of offices and, and all of that. So I think it's it's been a very difficult time for governments in terms of playing this balancing act um, and navigating between protecting people, but also having to have a continued economy that continues to grow. And so I think certainly for many of our businesses um, and our business models, um, it's been important to make sure that we're able to keep our businesses afloat. Um, so as an example, our, deli our food delivery business uh, became a lifeline uh, to restaurants. So within the businesses that we invested in, we had to make sure that we could support certain businesses. We had certain businesses that actually did even better, had a significant growth in revenue, but we also had businesses that were severely impacted uh, by COVID. And so in those instances, we had to make sure that we provide support in terms of equity um, and whatever funding uh, was required. Um, inevitably, activities which involve physical contact have been severely impacted uh, during this lockdown. And so the general trend has moved towards online. And so, you know, that is something that I think is underway uh, throughout the world. To a large extent, digital and tech uh, companies have played an important role in keeping economies afloat uh, during the hard lockdown uh, regulations. And I think certainly when you look across industries, whether you're looking at the financial services industry, as Sim was just painting out earlier, or whether you're looking at the mining industry, um, you'll find that people are coming up with different ideas around being able to operate from a digital perspective um, so that business can continue notwithstanding. And so over the long term, we think that this pandemic will have um, a long term um, impact in terms of the shift um, towards online. And we expect online penetration and consumer consumption patterns to increase significantly. Um, recent research shows that consumers, including in South Africa, um, intend to increase their online spend um, over COVID, after COVID-19. And so we, we expect to see uh, a lot of this online spend continuing post uh, the COVID-19 uh, period. In South Africa during lockdowns, market data shows that online retail grew around 40% and e-commerce revenue is expected to grow around 25% um, over the next uh, five years here in South Africa. This growth is supported by increased volumes from existing customers, um, high new customer acquisitions. Um, and so, you know, I think the world of having a physical retail place, um, it's, it's, it's changing. Visiting grocery stores, um, it, it, I think it will be a lot less popular than doing trade um, online. We've seen many sectors and companies around mm. the world adapt, as I mentioned earlier. And so I believe for many companies in the developing world that digital tools have become the lifeline for local businesses. And this has created a significant opportunity for the long-term growth and prospects um, of emerging companies and markets. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, uh, over to Fawn, as a leading entrepreneur in South Africa, can you give us a, your perspective on, the, on this question as well, please? Um, yes, John, um, I must say, you know, being restricted for two months, the market industry, we weren't allowed to do any trade whatsoever. So, so it had a significant impact. Um, everyone was worried. Um, um, the motor industry as a whole weren't set for a great year anyway. And then COVID came and we weren't allowed for, for other two months to sell any, any vehicles. So we were very relieved, you know, when the restrictions were lifted and we were allowed to trade. Obviously, 
we had to do that in a responsible way and make sure that the facilities was prepared and that our staff were educated to deal um, with this in a responsible way. Um, the employment relief scheme also helped during this pe uh, period because even though we uh, are a robust company, you know, to keep on paying salaries uh, for three months, you know, when there's just no cash flow was quite a challenge and uh, a lot of um, players in the industry had to retrench people. Thankfully, we did not need to do that. Um, but during this period, we, we learned a lot and, and I agree with uh, Sam who said earlier that business um, in their industry will never be the same and it's a very similar um, situation with us. Um, I think um, um, we accelerated significantly in, uh, in the way business will be done in the future. Um, as an example, you know, a year ago uh, we had a lot more feet um, at our premises and it has declined significantly um, by over 30 percent. Um, but sales are still higher than a year back because the consumer's behavior has changed. You know, our um, website sessions um, has risen dramatically by over 58 uh, percent uh, year on year and our unique visitors to our website has also increased by 53 um, percent. So, so that's that is significant, you know, considering um, the time we live in and uh, yeah, people's needs have just changed and the behavior is, is, is constantly changing and, and the companies who will survive are the ones who adapt to this change. Um, working from home is, 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 is something unique and uh, uh, very interesting, you know, it's an interesting dynamic that you find, you know, to, to, to spend a whole day at work. Traditionally, people thought that, you know, if you pitch up for, for work, you've ticked the box, you've worked, but now you have to actually show what you've done for the day when you work from home. So, so I believe people work harder. Um, we have contact centers um, that we, we felt that, you know, they'll, they'll lose their, their cohesiveness and their team spirit, but that has not been the case. You know, we embrace the technologies that's out there and, and it works very well for us. And I think we will continue to, to have um, uh, uh, at least a, 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 an element of work from home, you know, moving into the future. Um, and, and it saves people time. It, it, it raises your quality of life. You, you can have more personal time and, and, and you can set, um, you can decide when you want to do what. So, so it, it's very convenient, uh, especially, you know, if you still have a roster where you do spend time at work, you know, it, it, we do all have the need that interperson, personal contact um, with your colleagues. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. Now, it's often said that uh, crisis and change creates opportunity. I, I posted a panel what you see as the, the largest opportunities given COVID's lasting impact on consumer behaviors. Uh, Sim, could I ask you to comment from your side, please? Uh, John, so yeah, a few points. First of all, um, you've seen accelerated digital adoption, like my colleagues have said. Um, you know, in the first half of the year, uh, we saw the volume of activity in our branches and ATMs just fall, like I said earlier. Um, it was down 42% um, in South Africa, whereas digital transactions were up 78%. So the opportunity is to identify the changes in consumer behavior and uh, how to seize those opportunities as they arise. Um, the shift actually has been even larger in our businesses outside South Africa. Um, so branch activity in the rest of Africa is down roughly 26%, uh, and digital transactions are up 24%. The real interesting thing here is that corporate clients like Putti and the business and so forth, they up, their volumes are up 37% through our digital channels. Um, so the public health restrictions in South Africa have really uh, been very, very interesting in the impact that they've had uh, on us. Uh, we do think that notwithstanding the decline in physical and branch activity, um, we think it will return, but the role of the branch in our lives is going to be fundamentally different when we, uh, when we go forward. I think the opportunities that uh, have arisen have been to identify then uh, what are the new customer behaviors, what are the opportunities that have arisen uh, from, uh, from, from what has happened uh, to, to client behavior. Uh, what behavior changes have we seen, for example, amongst retailers? Um, 
uh, their relationship with SMEs? Uh, what are the changes in their value chain? And how do we participate in those changed uh, uh, value chain? Uh, the future of logistics companies has changed fundamentally. So tracking companies, uh, and as far will tell you, there is now a big opportunity in identifying which logistics companies you ought to support uh, and how they're going to uh, make more money going forward. Uh, let me stop there, John. Great. Puti, could I ask for your view as well, please? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, so I think I, I mentioned earlier that um, we've seen that e-commerce revenue um, is expected to grow by about 25% over the next five years here in South Africa. Um, what what really um, is, is something of, of importance to us is the fact that we see that through digitization, um, it has the, uh, the, the potential to address inequality um, by creating local um, opportunities um, through increased participation um, in a more inclusive um, economy. And so um, this is one of the reasons why we set up the NASPERS Foundry, which is a 1.4 billion rand fund, which we set up to back local entrepreneurs. So we invest in early stage uh, internet businesses. And to date, in fact, we were announcing transactions through this COVID period uh, because it is important that we continue to support um, these internet businesses in bad and good times as well. So to date, we've invested in an, a home line, uh, online cleaning business uh, called Sweep South. Um, we've also invested in an artificial intelligence agritech business uh, called Aerobotics. Um, and we've invested also in a B2B online food tech uh, marketplace called Food Supply Network. And we, we have um, other transactions that, that we're currently working on. But it, it just it shows the extent um, and significance to which we have a number of uh, tech um, entrepreneurs here in South Africa and founders need to be supported. Um, and, and our support is not only in terms of them being able to have equity in their businesses, but it's also about them being able to expand uh, to other marketplaces around the world. Um, and, you know, what we have seen over the years is that, you know, we've seen increased significant value uh, to our stakeholders by investing in and operating in these um, early stage online tech businesses and then seeing growth, supporting the founders in terms of growth. Um, and this is evident in some of our South African-based businesses such as Take A Lot, uh, Mr. D, Food um, Superbalist, Auto Trader, OLX, um, just to name a few. Um, South Africa's tech industry is showing significant growth and requires the requisite skills that will support the country in building the human capital needed in order to see the new growth trajectory that, that we're moving on. Um, the other thing that I spoke about, which is NASPERS Labs, where we are helping uh, young people, it is so important that as we are looking to support South Africa, that we are looking at the most uh, disadvantaged and least educated people. And so we're supporting the 17 to 25 year olds by ensuring that they have all the tech uh, training that they require so that they can be participants in the marketplace. Um, and so from that perspective, we've been rolling out those programs as well. And it's, it's really all about looking to draw on our global experience and ensuring that we're able to support South Africa locally through the global experience that we have. Great. Thanks for the color. Fawn, as an entrepreneur and a founder, I'd love your take on this as well. Um, yes, it's very exciting. Uh, I think um, as consumer behaviors are now shifting and, and back a few years in South Africa, you know, the access to data has just become a lot cheaper. And most people nowadays have smartphones. So, I think the big play uh, um, right now is in the digitalization, um, you know, IT processes and business transactions as such. Um, so, so any business who's ready, you know, to for that change, you know, um, will have a great opportunity. South Africa is, is is a late starter, you know, compared to the rest of the world. So, so there's various, you know, disruptions that, um, that that's bound to happen soon, you know. And I think um, uh, the way um, people conduct business is going to be very different five years from now. Big data and analytics, is, uh, you know, has an increasingly important role. Um, the, the way you use automated selling processes uh, will be paramount. So, uh, yes, uh, exciting time indeed for e-commerce. Fantastic. Now, uh, 
when I think about uh, the feedback that uh, the three of you have given us today so far, it seems like there's a real opportunity in South Africa that with digital transformation. Now, often government plays a leading role in this in setting policy, but large uh, organizations like the ones you run are often uh, fundamental in, in kind of uh, crystallizing this change. So let me start off with Sim. Uh, in, in broad strokes, can you give us a sense of what role you think government uh, plays with the opportunity provided today and the challenges? Um, so first of all, I think, uh, John, government can play a role by uh, improving the ease of doing business, um, by cutting out a lot of the red tape that makes it very, very difficult for people to form companies, um, uh, to hire and fire, uh, obviously, having regard to um, uh, principles of natural justice, but just to make it easier to, to do business. Secondly, what government can and should do is improve the competitiveness uh, of South Africa, um, again, by uh, contributing to, 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 to improving the soft and the hard infrastructure, in particular uh, in education. Thirdly, I think um, working much more closely with uh, the business community, the universities uh, and other sectors that contribute to the South African national competitive advantage in the spaces where we have got competition, uh, competitive advantages. Um, and so you can envisage a situation where South Africa could be a leading fintech hub in a similar way to Berlin, Tel Aviv uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other major cities by making it uh, much easier to attract skills, making it much easier for people to come, making it much easier for people to get work permits, making it much easier for people to make these investments, and actually also make it easier for companies to fail when they need to fail. Um, I think the next set of issues is uh, very careful thought about the regulation of uh, the financial sector and sectors adjacent to it. Um, on the one hand, I think it is important to allow new entrants in. Um, I'm sure my colleagues will be screaming at me when I say it's actually cool. It's actually great. Let uh, the likes of Ant Financial Services come and compete. But hey, John, if it quacks, it's a duck. So if they take deposits, let them be regulated like, uh, like other deposit takers. But clarity on, uh, on, on, on these regulations uh, and so forth. Um, I think it's important for the authorities to set the rules, um, make them very, very clear, but then for the authorities to get out of the way and let us uh, compete. I think it is important for South Africa, if you just let me finish this point, it is important for South Africa to realize um, that we're in competition with other major regions of the world as people are rebuilding their dislocated value chains, and we should be taking our fair share of those changes. So. What's happening in East Africa right now is tragic, for example, for Ethiopia. Well, what opportunities does that create for South African light manufacturing um, and so forth? Thanks. Fantastic. Puti, could I get your thoughts as well, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I, I very much agree with, with what Sim was saying. It's so important that South Africa is in a position to really be able to be seen as a competitive competitive marketplace, um, because at the end of the day, capital goes where it is most attractive to do business. And so when you look at the flow of tech funds, you see that the most significant uh, portion of tech funds is flowing into East Africa and into West Africa. And South Africa is very, um, it's, 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 it's behind with, with respect to the, the amount of, of tech capital that, that flows into it. And so from that perspective, it is important that South Africa is a, a very attractive um, investment destination. And, and we believe that it is. Um, and that is why we are prepared to do whatever we can to work with government to make sure that South Africa is that attractive uh, marketplace for investors. Um, I think the, the the issue, though, that that is concerning is the fact that we have seen uh, the Competitions Commission uh, coming out with um, new potential regulations um, for this uh, internet sector. And the concern is, is the fact that this still remains a nascent sector here in South Africa. And so this is a time when you actually need to 
provide as much um, opportunity for big tech players to want to come and invest here. Um, and, and so from that perspective, I think it is important that we see more interaction between regulators and the business people um, with respect to regulations um, that, that are appropriate uh, for, for South Africa. Um, and, and in addition to that, I think it, it is concerning that Spectrum continues uh, to, it, it still hasn't been rolled out at the last um, uh, president's conference that was held, um, there was announcement that there would be uh, an immediate rollout of Spectrum. We still haven't seen that. Um, and so these are things that, that are important because from a business perspective, all we can do is provide the capital and products that we have, but we need to have access to Spectrum for products to be developed. Um, and we need to make sure that we need to work in an environment where the legisl legislation is such that we are able to invest um, long term. And, and it is good. We we welcome seeing um, you know, other players like Google, Facebook and others who are in the marketplace, and we'd like to see more of them. But what you'll see when you look at the activities of most big internet players on the African continent is that their domicilium tends to, they, they might have an office here, but most of the activity tends to be in East Africa and in Nigeria. And we would like to see a lot more activity here in South Africa, but we need to see a bit more activity and a bit more you know, work working of a, a working relationship with the the players in the industry, so that we can have re regulations that are um, you know uh, attractive for investors, and and that we can have a marketplace that that is attractive. Fantastic, Thank fantastic. Thank you, Fan. Uh, thoughts as well. Um, yes, I agree with all the speakers. Uh, I think um, a, a big part of the frustration that businesses have is is the slow response time from government. Uh, uh, in many respects, whether it's it's a comcom -com issue or whether it's you know um, just communicating and, and getting feedback from government with ideas that businesses want to explore, um, so so um, uh, government is doing a great job with initiatives. There, there are so many um, support structures for businesses, but but when it comes to executing, they are really slow, and 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 it's probably one of the reasons why why um, South Africa is not developing as fast as we can. Um, but I'm really hopeful. I think a lot of these initiatives will come to light uh, in, in, in the in the years to come. And uh, I believe that South Africa is ripe for the picking, you know, as far as investors are concerned. This is not necessarily a bad thing because, um, you know, uh, there's an opportunity there for, for, for um, foreign investors to, to come in and make use of this opportunity because, uh, as uh, Uti said, it, it's nascent and, uh, and uh, that, that brings uh, an opportunity for investment. Fantastic. One of the things I'd like to bring up that's become increasingly important on investment radar are ESG issues. So social, uh, societal, governmental. Uh, I'd ask uh, the three panelists to think about uh, how ESG issues apply to their companies uh, and what they'd like to highlight in terms of uh, initiatives and priorities going forward. Uh, with that, Sim, could we get your thoughts, please? Yeah, John. So, um... So Standard Bank's purpose um, is Africa is our home, we drive a growth. Uh, and I would submit to you that that goes to the heart of who we are and what we stand for. It's a purpose-driven organization, and it's driven around the growth of the African continent. We perceive growth in all its dimensions in terms of GDP growth, but also growth in terms of human and social, environmental, and governance issues as well. And therefore, when we think about ESG, we think of it in the context of sustainable development goals, as well as the fact that we are a signatory to the, uh, the principles of sustainable banking. Therefore, our approach to our role on the African continent is as an organ of society that is operating within the context of sustainability. Um, and we approach our strategy having regard to our commitments, uh, for example, to the Paris Agreement when we think about the of ESG. When we think about ESG as well, uh, John, we think of it in the context of the classic dilemma between environmental and social issues. And in setting our strategies, we try and strike a balance between those two. Uh, we've recently uh, issued our policy in respect of uh, the TCFD uh, principles 
And we're also in the process of setting out our policies and principles in respect of fossil fuels, being very, very clear around how we think about uh, oil, how we think about gas, and how we think about the alternatives uh, uh, as they apply there. John, we op operate on the African continent, uh, which is definitely at a different level um, to where other countries are at. And that has to be taken into account when one thinks about when you fund particular assets. Uh, what are the implications when you think of that in the context of Article 4 of the Paris Agreement? Governance in all of that is very, very important. Uh, it's very, very important, therefore, to think about that triangle between uh, E, the S, and, uh, and, uh, and the G. We've always thought of ourselves as an organ of society and that our competitiveness as a business needs to make sure that we take account of all society's uh, uh, demands on us. We value, uh, we drive our company on the basis of five strategic value drivers. If I could just finish by making this point. They relate to customers, they relate to risk, they relate to um, governance issues, uh, and they relate importantly to social, economic, and environmental uh, principles. And those principles then force us to be committed to, 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 to a sustainable future. Thanks, John. Fantastic. Uh, Puti, over to you, please. Thank you. Similarly to what we, we were hearing Sim say, um, to NASPERS, um, ESG is a strategic priority for the group, and we are committed to the long-term sustainability of the group. ESG is championed uh, at an executive and at a board level uh, with the goal of integrating ESG into our overall strategy to drive better business outcomes. As an investor and as an operator, we look at ESG from two perspectives. One is from a responsible investing perspective, where we align our ESG po uh, policies to our investee companies, um, where we have control of the companies, they are required to align to the policies of the group. In the case where we have a minority interest, we typically have board seats and our board members carry our philosophy to those boards. Further, we engage with our businesses on an operational level to share best practice and offer training. We're working to understand our impact through the businesses we invest in and operate. We support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and have aligned to three SDGs at a group and five SDGs at a business level. At a group level, we contribute to SDGs five, which is gender equality, uh, SDG eight, which is decent work and economic growth, SDG nine, which is industry, innovation and infrastructure, and our business specific contributions are to the SDG three, uh, good health and well-being, SDG four, which is quality education, SDG 12, which is responsible consumption and production, SDG 13, climate uh, action, and SDG 17, which is partnership uh, for the goals. And so from our perspective, it is important that we ensure that we continue to work with our businesses that they and, and that they are implementing uh, the best practices. And so whilst uh, we, we don't control all of our businesses, those that we do control um, are required at the time that we invest um, to, to be in alignment. And so we're able to make sure that they are able to uh, be aligned to the ESG uh, uh, requirements. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Puti. Uh, Fawn, over to you, please. Could we get your thoughts as well? <clears throat> yeah, John. Uh... Yeah, these criteria are becoming increasingly important, uh, especially when companies like ours, you know, value being a, a responsible corporate citizen. Um, when talking about environmental criteria, you know, we, we've um, gone through some exercises that we're quite proud of. Um, we harvest rainwater at our facilities and use very little uh, municipal water. Um, we've uh, invested in photovoltaic uh, uh, electricity um, that, that also uh, limits um, the use of uh, grid electricity um, significantly. Um, so yeah, we, we've, we've uh, done quite a bit in that regard. You know, as, as far as social criteria is concerned, um, actually since the very beginning of We Buy Cars, we've, we've always um, invested a, a percentage of our profits back into the community um, as well as other work causes, yeah, not uh, not because we want we, we have to do it, but it's uh, it's the right thing to do, you know, to give back, and that's one of our values. 
Um, and then uh, with regards to governance, you know, um, it's, it's very important for any business, you know, because uh, investors may want to know, uh, you know, that a company has an accurate and uh, uh, clear accounting practices going on, um, uh, which is very, very important, you know, if you value your company and you want to grow. Fantastic. I'm, I'm mindful of time, but there's one last question I'd like to pose to the group. Uh, what would you highlight as, as either opportunities or risks, uh, specific to South Africa or emerging markets? Because investors uh, and individuals come with a certain mindset. And so what would you highlight as being different in a positive or negative way when looking at emerging markets versus perhaps a developed market opportunity? Uh, Sim, over to you. Uh, John, the fact that um, the African continent is now in the process of implementing uh, the Africa Free Trade Area Agreement. The fact that there will be increased ease of the movement of goods, people, uh, capital and ideas between African countries. Uh, the fact that uh, African countries have been very, very good at devising policies that improve the competitiveness of the regions and also the various countries. And the poster child there, the best example is East Africa where they've been very, very clear on policy, uh, the ease of doing business, making it easy for goods to move in that region. And as Putty was saying, uh, making themselves competitive in, the, in this digital age. I think the African continent provides a great opportunity to reintegrate global value chains, like I was saying, uh, whether it's East Africa or Southern Africa, where light manufacturing can move to, to, to the African continent. The African continent provides a vast opportunity. Uh, when you think about the demographics, it's a young population which is getting healthier and wealthier with greater disposable income. It provides a great opportunity to link between uh, the Silk Road, uh, the East, uh, the China-Africa corridor, but also provides great opportunities in the relationship between the African continent and the EU, as well as uh, the African continent and the United States. Um, and it provides uh, returns that adequately reward investors for the risk that they take on the African continent because the risks are not as high as they are perceived. And the living example of that is a standard bank group. Have a look at the cost of equity relative to the return on equity that the company generates over the long term, and it's a fantastic example. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sam. Over to you. Yes, um, I, I agree with the points that uh, Sim made earlier, um, and certainly with respect to the fact that we um, are a country that has uh, a young demographic dividend um, is something that stands in our, in our stead, as well as the high entrepreneurial uh, level that you see um, here on the continent. I mean, when you look at the business that Fun and his partners started, We Buy Cars, this is a business that didn't exist. And today it's a significant business and employer of, you know, many people here in South Africa. And so, you know, the, the ability for businesses to be created um, here on the continent um, and to grow to significant levels is something that we have seen over and over again. You look at businesses like Discovery and many others in, in different uh, industries. So, you know, we, we see South Africa as a country uh, of great um, opportunity. We see the African continent as a continent of, of great opportunity. And so that is why we, we are very uh, keen and remain very committed uh, to, to continuing to, to invest here. Um, and it's also good to see other big global tech players um, who are also seeing the opportunity of being invested on the African continent um, and actively investing um, here in South Africa as well. And so we've seen the likes of Google, AWS and others, Facebook, others who are actively working um, and engaging with government to ensure that we can reach our potential um, as a country. Because if, if we're going to continue to grow um, as, as, as a continent, um, and specifically if I look at South Africa as a country, um, it's, it's not something that government can do on its own. It's not something that South African businesses can do on their own. It needs all of business and governments to be able to work together. And so we there to work with other private sector players as well as with governments uh, to be able to see growth on this continent. Fantastic. Thank you, Pity. Afan, closing thoughts. Uh, yes, John, thanks. I agree with uh, my two colleagues. Um, I don't think the opportunity uh, in Africa should be underestimated. Um, I believe it was Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, who said that uh, 
um, Africa will lead the world's next digital revolution. And, and I agree with them. You know, there's plenty of opportunities to fund and help grow tech startups as well as other businesses in, in Africa, um, although it's, it's risky. So um, the advice I would give would be investors uh, would be, you know, to find companies where the entrepreneurs have prior successes, you know, just to, to lessen the risk, uh, but certainly um, uh, the, the risk involved um, uh, should should not be overestimated. Uh, I, I agree with Sim that there's this great opportunity for, for investing in Africa without large risks being taken and the rewards will be there. Fantastic. I'd like to thank everybody for their, their color, their comments, their insights. Uh, we're going to take a short break right now um, and we'll open the virtual forum for questions. So we'll return shortly for Q&A. Uh, there should be a box at the bottom where you can ask your questions and we will return shortly. Take care. Thank you so much to our panelists for those fascinating insights. We promise you more scintillating discussions tomorrow as we turn our focus beyond the Limpopo. The Sub-Saharan Africa region is expected to return to meaningful growth second only to the Southeast Asia region. What will drive this growth in the future? Well, we'll find out from our expert panel tomorrow. That's it from me, Nikiwe Bigita. I'll be back with you on Friday. Ms. Fifi Peters will continue the discussions with you tomorrow and Thursday. Thank you once again for joining us.